My dear brothers and sisters, it is a great opportunity to be here, and I'm grateful for the privilege of coming back to BYU. As I see all of you coming from classes and met some of my old professors, I felt like maybe I ought to be coming from a class also. I feel that BYU and our family are very intertwined. Not only did I graduate from here, but my wife graduated from here, and as has been mentioned, we have two daughters. When our oldest daughter, hopefully, graduates next year, we, uh, she will not only graduate, but will represent the fifth generation of our family to have graduated from Brigham Young University. Uh, my wife and I both graduated from here, met here. My mother graduated from BYU, met my father here. My grandmother graduated from BYU and met my grandfather here. Uh, my great-grandfather, uh, George H. Brimhall, was one of the first students at BYU and, in fact, returned some time later to uh, be preside over this institution for close to 20 years. So uh, he was married before he came here as a student, unfortunately. So. Um, so you can see that our family is pretty well uh, immersed with BYU. I ask for your faith and prayers that what is said and particularly what is heard this morning will be under the guidance of the Spirit of God. If we can all increase our faith and our determination to live closer to our Father in Heaven, then we will have accomplished the purpose of this devotional. And while it may not be as entertaining as you may want, I think it will be important at least the message I would like to give. Let me begin by asking you a very simple question. The question is this. What is your mission? Now, you might stop and think, well, let's see, I served in Japan or I served in Virginia or wherever, and that's fine, but that's not what I'm asking. I mean, what is your mission now? What is your mission in life? What does God expect you to accomplish during your sojourn here upon the earth? And are you doing it? I hope that in the next few moments, with the help of the Spirit of the Lord, we can all realize anew, if we haven't realized it, uh, if we have known it before, or reaffirm in our lives the importance of at least three things. First, that God, our Father in Heaven, does have a specific mission for all of us to fulfill and perform here upon the earth while we're here that we can, in this life, here and now, discover what that mission is. And thirdly, that with His help we can fulfill that mission and know and have assurance here and now, in this life, that we are doing that which is pleasing to our Father in Heaven. Now those are all very, very important concepts, and they're all true. If we don't know what our mission is, if we're not sure, if we're uncertain as to whether we are in fact fulfilling it, if we don't have the positive assurance in our lives that our actions and our performance are pleasing to our Father in Heaven, and it doesn't really matter what else we're spending our time doing, it's not as important as finding out what we should be doing and having the assurance that we are doing it. Or put another way, if we are really interested in doing our Father's will, we had better pay the price, whatever price is necessary, Pray however fervently we must, study the scriptures and listen to the brethren however intently needed, or in short, do whatever is required so that we can have the assurance that we are doing what our Father in Heaven wants us to do, that we're moving in the general area of the mission He has for us to perform. And obviously that mission will be different for different ones of us. Now, that revelation won't come all at once. God will unfold it to us line upon line according to what is best for us and how we're capable of handling it and for the pro progression of His work. But you have to start, and I assure you that you can and should know that you are on the right path and that your performance, no matter where you are on that path, whether you're a student or a missionary or newly married or whatever, is pleasing to the Lord. Listen to what Nephi tells us in the second chapter, or in the thirty-second chapter, verse 9, Second Nephi. But behold, I say unto you that ye must pray always and not faint, that ye must not perform anything unto the Lord, save in the first place ye shall pray unto the Father in the name of Christ, that he will consecrate thy performance unto thee, 
that thy performance may be for the welfare of thy soul. And everything we should do, everything we do, should be done for the Lord. And we ought to make sure that it's what He wants us to do. Now, that's pretty powerful doctrine. It's mostly powerful because it's true. Many of you will say, okay, I believe all that, but, but how do I go about finding what I'm supposed to do? How do I know what my mission and calling is? If I were just going on a full-time mission, I send in a bunch of papers to Salt Lake and someone else makes the decision for me and sends me to Germany or Texas or Japan or someplace. But how about this? How do I understand? Someone said, not of this subject but of another subject, if you have to ask the question, there's no way of giving you the answer. That is only partially true in this case, for while every person must ultimately receive his own revelation and assurance as to his life's mission, there are great helps available to us. I will review some of these with the hope that they will help all of us in discovering that answer of what our mission is in our lives. And I use the word discover advisedly, for it connotes the correct feeling of something that already exists but needs to be found by those who would benefit from its use. To discover then our calling in life, the first and most fundamental thing we must do is to follow the Savior, our Savior, the world Savior. Learn of Him, learn what He did, and then do it. The things that He did, though they were 2,000 years ago, have universal application. Now that may seem pretty general to you, but it's the basis of all else. You will have to do that by studying and personally studying the scriptures and his life and personally becoming acquainted with him. And incidentally, when you do that, when you, you'll have your questions answered. But on the route to achieving this personal relationship with the Savior, let me give you five specifics to begin with. First, get yourself worthy and keep yourself worthy to honestly hold a temple recommend. Now, that covers a big area. I'm not going to go into detail. You can get the details from your bishop, and I'd suggest you do it. Secondly, get a patriarchal blessing, or if you already have one, study it carefully and prayerfully yourself, not, not necessarily with others. Third, read the scriptures daily and prayerfully. Uh, daily and prayerfully. We all must do that. Fourth, pray diligently and fervently at least every night and every morning. Fifth, Start moving in some direction. Start doing something. Take a course. Uh, go on a date. Choose a major. Start somewhere in some area that at least you don't feel negative about. Maybe you feel negative about everything, but start in the one you feel least negative about. In other words, don't just sit and wait for a great big revelation. Don't wait to be changed. Don't wait to be transferred. Don't wait to be moved. Don't wait for a different situation. Start where you are now. Let me mention an experience here that fits directly into this subject. I had the opportunity of serving a full-time mission, as was mentioned in Tongue over 20 years ago. I had two great and wonderful mission presidents. The first one, when I arrived, said, I've got just the place for you. There's a, it's a small island several hundred miles from here. Seven miles around, has about 700 people on it, and there's not a white person there and no one speaks English. I want you to go up there and not come back until you know the discussions and you know how to speak English or speak Tongan. Well, I went, and to put it mildly, there were lots of problems. I, uh, I didn't have a companion in the traditional sense of the word. I, I did have a, a, a young a priest who was a better man than I was, but he went with me. There were, but there was lots of growth. At one time, we came close to starving to death, literally, uh, because of a hurricane and a wrecked boat and so forth. On another occasion, we were subject to some physical, uh, serious physical threats and, and actual abuse. At one time, we went a little over four months without mail. I don't cry too often when missionaries tell me they've missed a mail for a week, but uh, things have improved. And it, but it was. It was over four months. Uh, you learn to live with these things, but we kept moving. We kept doing things. Even though we only had 700 people in a very limited area and we didn't know the language, or at least I didn't, 
the important thing was to keep doing something. And I'm sure we did some wrong things, although let me add here that whenever there was a possibility of our doing something seriously wrong, the Lord let us know in no uncertain terms that it was wrong. And while we could have done it, we only could have done it through deliberate defiance of His definite impressions to us. Thankfully, we never did, and I, I give you that assurance. If you're striving to do the right, the Lord will let you know if you're starting to do something wrong. Listen. I'm sure there is much more good we could have done, but at least we never stopped. We kept going. We did something, and that's important. The facts are that when I left that little island after 13 months—I guess I was a little dumb, it took me that long to learn the language, although the mission president got transferred in the meantime, and I guess the new one didn't know where I was, left me there. I was alive and well. I knew the discussions. I knew the language. Many souls had been baptized into the restored gospel. I had been present, not out of desire, but out of necessity, because they thought the white man knew everything. When many children had been born and when others had died, I'd held many in my arms as they passed away. But maybe most important, I came away knowing at least three things. And we can all come away from our life's experiences knowing these things, and we should, and we must. I knew that God lived and that He had all knowledge and all power, and that He was literally the Father of our spirits, and that He loved us as His children, which we are. He loved us each personally and individually, and that He especially watches over His missionaries. I not only had faith or confidence in that, I knew it. Secondly, I knew that Jesus Christ was His Son our Savior and Redeemer, a real person, a true friend, one who gave his life for us and will let us know that he gave his life for us, one who loves us and whom we, who we can love in a way that defies human comprehension, one who has helped us more than we may ever know and who now helps us in many great ways that we as yet do not comprehend one through whom we can look forward to a glorious resurrection of our bodies and a forgiveness of our sins and an eventual opportunity to stand in the presence of our Father in heaven, cleansed and pure. And that's very important. I plead with you to love Him with all your hearts. You'll be a better person, and you'll be on the path to knowing your mission and calling in life. And that's the third point. I knew that God had a mission for me and for all men and all women. It's our purpose here is to fulfill our mission. I didn't know exactly what it was in every detail, and that didn't matter. I knew that I had to live more closely in tune with Him, and I knew I had to do better, and I knew where to start. I knew the path, and that was the important thing. I knew I could trust Him. I knew that He would, in His own way and according to His timing, let me know what other things He would have me do to fulfill this mission He had in mind for me and to receive the joy that comes therefrom. I have not been disappointed, and neither will you. When the new mission president arrived, and as I mentioned, eventually found out where I was, he transferred me to another area. I only worked in two areas in my whole mission, of, and at uh, th that time of, there were a little longer missions, and I had to stay over in a few. It was nearly 36 months from the time I left till I got home. This second area consisted of 16 small islands. That mission president told me that we were so short of missionaries that I would have to go out alone. He said to do what I could to preach the gospel and build up the church on those 16 islands, and that was my instructions. I, uh, he forgot to tell me that we were supposed to fill out reports. I thought they'd changed the procedure, so I didn't fill out any more the rest of my mission. Um, I suppose that gave me more time to work. I'm not sure. But uh, again, I tried. There were in some of those islands good members. We mostly traveled by small sailboat. I suppose the Lord has His way of testing all of us. It seems uh, that I was born with a weak stomach, and most of my both boat trips, which were many, found me very ill. I remember taking a small boat on a preaching trip at one time. We would go to one island and track all day and invite everyone out to the meeting that evening. These islands, the whole island usually came as, I'll have to admit it, there probably wasn't that much else to do. And it was novel to hear a Paulong or white man speak their language. I suppose the average island would have from a few hundred to several hundred inhabitants. I don't think any of them had into the thousands, maybe one or two. In the evening, I would go through all the lessons, 
because I knew I wouldn't be back for a few months, so I'd just start with one, and we'd spend three or four hours and go through all the lessons. Uh, and then I'd ask the people to um, pray sincerely that evening about what they had heard. Those who felt it was true and had a testimony of it should be down to our boat by 8 a.m. the next morning to be baptized and confirmed before we left for the next island. We often baptized quite a few people, and they were good members of the Church. We would leave, and then we came back a few months later, and well, we gave them instructions, of course, and we called on couples from some of the other branches to come and help them. And thus, by constantly going around, we gradually build up several good branches that, that have today evolved into some very good, very good branches and some very good leaders from those people. Because when they joined, there was a lot of persecution in those days, and they were pretty committed. They, they had a spiritual conversion. It wasn't a social thing to join the Church. It was, they had to believe it. After completing one of these rounds in a more than usually successful way, we were headed home in a very happy or a very grateful mood for the success the Lord had blessed us with. The sea was rough, but we weren't concerned because we were in the hands of the Lord. As we got close to our home island, the rough weather became more severe. The wind became stronger and the waves higher. Suddenly, we found ourselves caught in a regular tropical squall, which, though brief, can be very dangerous. I felt, well, we will get through this all right. After all we've done and the success the Lord has blessed us with, we shouldn't worry about this. But the storm increased in intensity, and suddenly, with the emergence of two huge waves, the captain shouted those fateful words to the six of us aboard, Abandon ship. Now, you can hear a lot of phrases in this life but there are a few as fearsome as those spoken by a captain <laughs> in the midst of giant waves and inconceivable turmoil of elements. We did what we had to do and dove in as the gargantuous waves thundered down on our frail little craft, leaving it broken and listless, and the six of us sprawled on the surface of a boiling sea, struggling for our lives. Now, I probably hadn't read all the missionary rules, but I knew that missionaries weren't supposed to swim, but sometimes you don't have any choice. Uh, we struggled against huge odds to make the nearest shore, which was a small island we had just passed. I remember thinking that this really shouldn't be. We shouldn't be going through this, but we were, and all my thinking or wondering didn't do much good. Only swimming and exerting all the energy and effort I had helped. Well, after a long time, as I recall, it was well over an hour of swimming. We finally made it to shore, exhausted but alive and gratefully so. Just to feel the firm ground under our feet was a great blessing. How much more I appreciated life and solid ground than I had before. Just to be in that boiling sea and realize how tenuous life is, how quickly this earth life could come to an end, made a great impression on me. Sometimes we literally have to travel over rough waters in order to appreciate some of, the, some of the fundamental blessings we have, like life, for instance. We probably don't begin to understand or appreciate life as we should until we begin to see or sense or recognize death and the closeness it has to all of us. As we sense these things, we can more clearly comprehend that there, in fact, is a mission for us to perform, and we'd better be with it. This whole experience gave me a new outlook and appreciation for life which I had not experienced before. As I look back now, there was much more than our own strength involved in that horrendous task of getting to shore, but it still took all we could do, and it will take all we, the rest of us can do to fulfill our missions, but there will be more than our effort to get them accomplished. The storm passed rather rapidly. But we were stranded for several days before we got things together and were able to make our way home over a much friendlier sea. I remember reading a poster once that said, A ship in a harbor is safe, but that is not what ships are made for. I think that applies to our lives. We may pass through troubled times, but if we constantly seek nothing but security, we're not doing probably what we should. We need to seek the security of, spiritually of, the, of knowing we're doing the Lord's will, and that sometimes will not give us all the physical security we may desire, but it will give us what we need. 
We made it. You'll make it. Everyone will make it if they'll do what they should. See, I'm here. You probably wished I'd have drowned. But uh, I'm alive. I did return home. I did get married. We have been blessed with the family and been able to make a living and received many great opportunities to serve in the Lord's kingdom. No matter what the Lord requires of you, if you keep trying, you will be able to fulfill the mission He has in store for you. While I would not have chosen that experience or some other experiences I had, and I'll have to admit there were times when I was not as positive as I would like to have been about the outcome, the fact remains that a big part of my subsequent happiness and your subsequent happiness and joy has to be traced to some of those so-called unwanted experiences. We don't need to seek them. Heavens knows they find us out more often than we desire. All we have to do is try with all our might to live the way we should and leave the rest to the Lord. We then realize the truth of the statement that problems are what we see when we take our eyes off the goal. Once we incorporate the available God-given directions in our lives, find our mission, discover our calling, look out, world, here we come. That's the way you've got to feel, and that's what's got to happen for us to be happy and for us to do what the Lord wants us to do and to accomplish His purposes and build His kingdom and achieve the potential He has for us to achieve. Now, let's bring that right back to reality to today. You are students, most of you here at BYU. You are concerned about several things. You're concerned about getting married, if you're not already married. You are concerned about meeting and being sure of the right person who will be your eternal companion. You are concerned about gaining a knowledge of some profession and finding a job and hopefully having time and means to help build the kingdom. This concern is, your, in effect, your desire to know your mission and calling in life. Maybe you'd like to be a teacher, but you know, well, there aren't many teaching jobs available now, so what do I do? Do you go into teaching or do you go into, uh, say, cabinet making, which may not require all the college education teaching does, but sure could make a lot of money? Well, these are very valid questions, and they are direct, have directly to do with what we are talking about, fulfilling your mission and calling in life. As you are obedient to the principles which we've talked about, I promise you that you not only are entitled to, but you will receive revelation, inspiration, and answers to these fundamental question, questions. They're important to you and they're important to the Lord. You can receive that right here and now, and you can feel good about the direction you are going. Now, as mentioned, I got a master's degree and I taught for a while. I loved it. I would still be doing it, except I didn't feel that that was my calling, at least not in a professional sense. I went into the contracting and development business and felt positive assurance that that is just what I should be doing. I didn't have any great revelation saying, you be a contractor or don't be a teacher, but I did experiment with a few things and turned from those I didn't feel right about and moved in the direction of those I did feel right about, and soon ended up building homes and apartments and commercial buildings and so forth. Now, that isn't for everyone. Fortunately, it's not for everyone because some of the greatest teachers I've run across were here at the Y, and I'm glad they chose their calling in that field. But it was for me, and you have to decide and know what yours will be. Let me just spend a moment on an item here that I have, uh, as I've talked to people, think a great many people, particularly members in the Church, don't understand. A lot of our people, including a lot of you, have, have great amounts of faith, but often they tend to distort that faith a little by saying, I'm not going to move until I receive a positive assurance, a, a burning in the bosom, as it were, that that's the right thing to do. Now, you're all familiar with the scripture where Oliver Cowdery, I believe it was, was trying to translate and he couldn't do it. The Lord explained that he had to figure it out himself, and if it was right, he would give him a burning in his bosom, and if it was wrong, he'd have a stupor of thought and so forth. I'm not, many people say, well, I'm not going to move because I don't have that burning in my bosom. No, I'm not positive about that person 
or I'm not positive about this field, or I'm not positive about that. We want to be positive about everything, and we feel like we've got to have this burning all the time. I'm, they, often people say, well, I'm confused. I don't know what to do. And so what in effect they do is they end up treading water and, and not doing anything, or, real, or not making any real progress. And that in and of itself is a great sin. Uh, we shouldn't do things wrong, and as I said before, the Lord will let you know when things are wrong, but for heaven's sakes, do something. Uh, this lengthening of our stride and quickening of our pace that our modern-day prophet and the Lord's spokesman, spokesman talks so much about can happen if we're standing still. We've got to be moving. Let me tell you what I've discovered, and this is somewhat repetition, and I don't want to say that we won't get that burning uh, in, uh, in our bosom, for we will when it's the right thing. And in my life, there have been quite a few occasions where there was absolutely no question about it. That burning was there. I, I've had the experience of, for instance, installing stake presidents where there's absolutely no question. It was just positive, that's the man to be the stake president now, and, and other situations. But generally, it's been the other way, particularly in not talking so much about church callings, but talking about our opportunities uh, for progress in life in a, in a physical sense, um, where I have tried to figure it out myself, tried to figure whether I ought to go into business or into teaching or into the arts or whatever, and as I have begun to proceed along one path, having more or less gathered what facts I could, if that decision has turned out to be wrong or was taking me down the wrong path, not that it was an evil one, but, but not right for me, without fail, the Lord has always let me know just this emphatically, now that's wrong. Don't go that way. That's not for you. Now, on the other side, there may have been two or three ways that I could have gone, any one of which would have been right and would have been in the general area of providing the means whereby I could fulfill the mission that he had in mind for me. Because he knows we need the growth, he generally does not point and say, now open that door, go that direction 12 yards, and then turn right and go two miles and so forth. But if it's wrong, he'll let us know. You'll feel that for sure. I'm positive of that. So rather than saying, I won't move until I have this burning in my heart, let's turn it around and say, I'll move unless I feel it's wrong to do. And if it's wrong, then I won't do it. You see, by eliminating all of these wrong things, very quickly you'll find yourself going in the direction that you ought to be going, and then you can receive the assurance, all right, I'm going in the right direction, I'm doing what my Father in heaven wants me to, because I'm not doing the things he doesn't want me to do. And you can know that for sure. Now that's part of the growth process, and that's part of accomplishing what our Father in heaven has in mind for us. L let me quote again from Nephi again from the 32nd chapter of, of uh, Second Nephi, where he says, And behold, my beloved brethren, I suppose that ye ponder somewhat in your hearts concerning that which ye should do after ye have entered by the way. That is, after you've become members of the church, have been baptized and received the gift of the Holy Ghost, or, or after you've really seriously decided, now I really want to find out what my mission and conning is. Then he proceeds, But behold, why do ye ponder these things in your heart? Why aren't you sure? Do you not remember that I said unto you that after ye had received the Holy Ghost, ye could speak with the tongue of angels? And now how could you speak with the tongue of angels, save it were by the Holy Ghost? Angels speak by the power of the Holy Ghost, wherefore they speak the words of Christ. Wherefore I said unto you, feast upon the words of Christ, that is, study the scriptures, listen to the modern-day prophets and your priesthood leaders, for behold, the words of Christ, that is what they tell you, and the scriptures, will tell you all things what ye should do. Now, that's pretty powerful, isn't it? All things? Even what I ought to do for a living? Well, you read it. It's right there in the 32nd chapter of 2nd Nephi. Of Second Nephi. Yes, all things. I assure you that by following these procedures, you can receive answers and assurance to all things necessary to the fulfilling of your mission and calling in life. And that has got to include at least these two uh, most important concerns as to who you should marry and what profession you should go into. 
Now, this talk isn't on courtship and marriage, and even though I realize that's a popular subject down here at the Y. I, uh, I do want to make just one point in this regard. Unless the feeling of love and desire to want to be together forever is mutual between the boy and the girl, it probably is not of God. I've been a mission president. I've known the positive sureness and aggressiveness of outstanding young elders, and I would only caution you, all of you, that you cannot receive a one-sided revelation from God that is sure and true and correct in regards to eternal marriage. Only as both parties feel the same way can you have the assurance that it is from the Lord. Those who try to force another's free will into their supposed revelation mold are doing a great disservice to themselves and to their friends, and until the feeding is mutual, the good envisioned in such a union will not come to pass. So don't fall for this one-way re revelation bit. On the other hand, when you feel it's right, and it may not come all at once, don't try to fight it. The Lord's greatest institution and the means whereby He always has and always will bring to pass the greatest blessings is the family unit you have the opportunity of creating by making the proper decision. Just make sure you're right, not forced, but not withholding either, and God will bless you now and forever. Well, as to your profession, our time is moving on. I just want to leave you my assurance that he will bless you. You can know what He wants you to do for a living. I, uh, I've often thought that in our day and age, and I think there's some precedence in the scriptures on this about uh, pollution in the last days and so forth, that one of the areas we could look seriously at and feel good about is in this area of, uh, of cleaning up our environment. Uh, that's a big area. I have a feeling that it's going to get worse, and there are going to be a lot of jobs in that area. Uh, I'm convinced that uh, the Lord's against pollution. He's against perversion. He's against prostitution, and, and prostitution has a much broader meaning than just, than just in a limited sexual sense. That is, prostitution really means perverting something from its correct use to an incorrect use. I would think that prostitution and pollution and perversion are all about the same, and God's against those things. How we treat Him is reflected by how we treat others who are His children and how we treat the elements and other forms of life on this earth which are His. He created them. If there were one safe area, I think that's where it would be. Let's work on that. And I don't know whether that'll be your thing or not. But I'm convinced in my own mind that we have not really fulfilled our mission in life as individuals or as a church till we have demonstrated and shown as much advancement in other areas as we have in theology. That is, we know how government ought to be. We know how society ought to be. We know what cleanliness ought to be. We know what the environment really should be. We uh, we know how we should treat it. We recognize that we have environmental problems. I'm not sure what the answer is. I don't think the answer is what most environmentalists think it is, and that is to stop whatever we're doing, because as a race we must produce, and I'm not, I'm not sure that, uh, uh, how to do it. I think the Lord is not pleased with the constant corruption and pollution we so willingly endure to achieve some of these ends, not just spiritually but physically. I personally can't help but believe that there's a better way. I can't help but feel that God knows how to transform all of these base materials into useful tools without all the choking clouds of dust and stents of pollution in our rivers and streams. He put them here, and He put us here, and He knows what we need, and He knows what's here, and He knows how to get, get it done. I don't think He's against cars. I don't think He's against transportation. I don't think He's against derogation or, or the other things that are necessary. I don't think he's against energy. I think he's for all these things. I think he wants us to use them in the proper way and to get around and do his work and build his kingdom. But my faith is that there's a better way than we now have. He wants us to use the elements, to mold them to our use, but in a different way. Now, shouldn't that be something that you students here at BYU could figure out with the Lord's help? Who should be closer to him than you? We've talked about missions for individuals and we are all aware of the church mission. In my mind, and just as a throwing the thought out, BYU, is, as part of the church's mission, should become the pollution control center of the world, not only spiritually but physically. I think that's important. We take the gospel to all the world in a spiritual way. We ought to do it in other ways also. Well, we'll have to close. These are things that we could work and feel good on. We spent a lot of time uh, discussing these various points. I hope you understand 
I hope you can see clearly that it is true that our Father in Heaven does have a mission for you to perform. We can know what it is. We can know it now, at least the part we need to know. Maybe not a long ways ahead, but enough for now. And we can do it. And we can have the assurance that we are doing it right now. What does the Lord mean when He tells us we cannot be saved in ignorance? You're here to study something, I suppose, and that we must gain knowledge in order to be saved. Knowledge of what? Knowledge of the gospel, of course, but I think even more. I believe the knowledge that he's talking about, the knowledge that saves and that he requests us to seek, is the knowledge or assurance that we are filling our mission, that we are doing his will, and that he is pleased with our efforts. Let me close by relating a brief experience that occurred a few years ago again in the islands. It will demonstrate the universality of the basic premise that we began with, you do have a mission, you can perform it no matter where you are or under what circumstances you may live, be it here in the United States or on a small island in the Pacific. So I conclude with that story and testimony. Let us all reevaluate our lives and make sure that we are doing with them what the Lord would have us do. Years ago, as a young missionary, I was impressed by an older island couple who always seemed to be helping the missionaries and others. Every time I went to their home, I could find them reading the scriptures or fixing a meal for a missionary or tending a neighbor's child or preparing a Relief Society lesson or rendering some sort of service. They weren't blessed with children of their own, but they were always helping so-called outcast children. I was soon moved to another area and left for home without ever returning. I often wondered about that couple who had so impressed me. I was sure the Lord would bless them. Years later, I was again in the area, and a messenger came and asked if I would visit a certain old widow named Louisa. Upon inquiring, I realized that it was the family I had wondered about all these years. Her husband had obviously passed away, and as the messenger gave me the address, I realized she was still in the same old house she had been in those many years before. It was late afternoon when we drove up to the home. I was surprised to realize that hardly anything had changed. It was a neat, clean home, but a very humble one. As I walked up to the house, I noticed her waiting by the open door. She held her hand out in a slightly waving fashion. Then I realized that she had gone blind. As I took her in my arms, I realized also that she had not longed to stay in this life, as there was nothing but the frailest body of skin and bones. We sat and visited, and she talked about her desire to help the poor people. I suggested that she may need some help herself rather than giving help. She kindly informed me that she was rich and had nothing to worry about. I was a little confused and began to inquire. I found that they had often saved money to pay their airfare to the temple, only to end up lending it to someone else who needed it more. When all the facts came out, I said to her, Louisa, how can you say you don't have anything to worry about? You have no husband. You have no children. You're blind. You're in poor health. You live in a poor home. You haven't been to the temple. How can you say you're rich? Then she stopped all my questions by quietly informing me that she was rich because she knew the Lord was pleased with her life. She said, I know I will be with my husband soon. I know the Lord will bless us with a family. I know that I have not done all that I should, but that the Lord is pleased with what I have done. I cannot express fully what happened at that time. However, I would like you to listen to the seventh verse of the sixth section of the Doctrine and Covenants, wherein the Lord says, quote, Seek not for riches, but for wisdom. And behold, the mysteries of God shall be unfolded unto you, even the discovering of your own mission and calling. And then shall you be made rich. Behold, he that hath eternal life is rich. You see, Louisa had taken the time to discover her mission and calling in life and had done whatever is necessary to fulfill it. Again, what is your mission? I plead with you, discover it, fulfill it. I assure you it is worth it. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.